Good morning. I want you to hold your hands up like this. I want to see all, both hands like this with your palms facing me. And, your, and, and I want to say congratulations. I think everyone that I can see has 10 fingers still. Last week when I sent you home uh, at about 12.30, I said you don't hurt yourself and you did a good job. You made it through 4th of July without, without blowing off any fingers. We had a good time at the Caulfields and we didn't blow any fingers off either. I want to re, uh, revisit something that Daniela said, and that is if you go back to that slide, uh, the prayer gathering. Um, this is something that we have done for seasons in the past, and, and, and they've been fruitful seasons for us as a church. And this is a season that we will move through again. And I don't mean to imply that it's going to be a brief season. I don't mean to imply that we're only going to pray for six months. Uh, all I mean to say is I'm, I, I have a high degree of anticipation that this next season is going to be fruitful. And so I've told you that I, I'm thinking in terms of the next 18 months as we move out of uh, the difficult season that we have been as a church and a city and a county and a, and a state and a country, and I don't mean to uh, uh, make light of the fact that much of the world, and including pockets of our country, are still really struggling with this pandemic. So I don't mean to make light of that at all. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it just feels like we're moving into a new season, a new era, and so I'm highly anticipate, uh, I highly anticipate fruitfulness and growth and, 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 and spiritual depth uh, and, and new friendships being formed and, and great fellowship being experienced. And so I told you uh, about a month ago that we were moving toward a period in which we would gather on a weekly basis and we would just pray, just meaning only pray. So I'll be here. The, the, we as your elders will be here to pray with you and to pray for you. And the majority of the prayer time, if not all of the prayer time, will really be you silently praying in your seat as an individual or with a friend or with your family or with a group of friends or with your gospel community. It's going to be a meaningful time. We're going to do it every week. I'm going to be here every week. Uh, and uh, I look forward with great anticipation. I look forward to seeing what God will do um, on Tuesday nights. Um, I, I dare say it's the most important thing we're going to do as a church this next season. So I look forward to that. I look forward to that. So we are uh, week two into a new series. You, you, were, you may have been gone last week, uh, given that it, was, uh, that it was July 4th. And so I'm not going to... Well, Lydia and I used, to, I used to work under this pastor, old West Texas pastor, and he was Southern Baptist. You ever, you ever grew up Southern Baptist? This, this will ring true with you. He would say this. Do you remember he would say, he would, he would, he would preach his whole, whole sermon, and then he'd sing a song of like a stanza of Just As I Am, and, and, then, he would, and then he'd get the mic and he'd, he'd say this. He was a very well-educated man. He would say, now, I, I ain't going to re-preach this sermon. And then he would proceed to about 20-minute like summary of that sermon. I'm not going to do that. Um, but I'm going to try to catch you up to speed just, just a bit. So we're, we're, we're in the summer of love, and uh, last week we talked about uh, specifically the story of Jesus binds us together as friends. But the question that is begged is, okay, but how? If the story of Jesus, if it binds us together as friends, how? Like, what do I do? do. We're always looking for something to do, right? How does it bind us together as friends? And so that's actually what we're going to talk about week two, the summer of love. We're going to talk about how do I find friendship with the Lord? And, and I wish I could, I wish I could re-preach all of that, but I can't, but it's online. You can go see it. How, how do I find friendship with the Lord? And how do I find friendship with others? And that's what we're talking about today. When I say the word love, and I make a statement such as, you know, the church should be a place of, of love, that's probably not a hard sell for you because you've probably heard that. You may have actually experienced, like functionally, functionally for you, the church may have been a place in which love was absent. In fact, in fact for many of us, we've had, we've had experiences uh, that would lead us to believe that the church is not a place of love, that the church is perhaps a place of judgment or a place of competition or a place of posturing, a place where we size one another up 
where I attempt to level up so that I can actually hang out with you or, or you uh, fake it so that you can hang out with the pastor or, you know, whatever. Uh, but you've probably at least heard, heard of the concept that the, the, that the church is supposed to be a place of love. It came from, from the lips of Jesus. When, when, he, when he made a statement, roughly it went like, the whole world will know you are mine because of your love for one another. So that's what Jesus said. Jesus said, that they'll see you and they'll be like, wow, that's a very loving, that's a very loving group. It's a very accepting group. It's a, it's a very warm group, like genuine love. There's, there's, there's little or no fakery. They, they, they just they, they come together. That big word that we learned last week for fellowship, the Greek koinonia. Try and say that one more time for me just because I, I love the word. Koinonia. Would you say that? And it's, I'm not just dropping Greek. It, it, it was important. It was significant in, 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 in last week's sermon. And, but but, but that, that fellowship, Jesus said, you, you'll come together in fellowship, and the whole world will look at you and be like, they must be Jesus followers. That must be what Jesus is like. So Jesus said that in the, in the Gospel of John, it's recorded among other places. It's recorded in the Gospel of John. And here's where we're going. Here's where I'm headed with this. So the Gospel of John, written by John the Apostle, who started out with the nickname uh, the, the son of thunder, like he was a NASCAR racer, the son of thunder, but he ended up, he ended up with a different nickname, and that was the one whom Jesus loved, the one whom Jesus loved. So, so, the, so John the Apostle, he wrote the Gospel of John, so he recorded, he recorded, hey, Jesus just said something important here. Jesus said that we're going to be marked by our love, we're going to be known by our love, and so John recorded that. And then you move forward in the, in the New Testament, you get to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, way toward the end of the New Testament. 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the epistles, and, and an older man, an older man, um, same guy, the Apostle John, he writes, and he, he writes all about how the church should be a place in which we love one another, in which we fellowship with one another, in which we, we have one another's backs. Uh, and then you, you move even beyond that to the book of Revelation, which we're not going to study. In fact, in the summer of love, we're only studying 1st uh, John. Um, the first epistle of John. But he go all the way to Revelation, and the same guy, the same dude wrote that book too. John the Apostle. He wrote the Gospel of John when he was, when he, he was known as the, the, the one whom Jesus loved. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He's older and he's concerned because the church is fracturing and splinting and he, splintering and he wants them to come, to come together in love. And then he writes, he writes the book of Revelation. And once again, we get this beautiful picture of this loving relationship between like older brother Jesus, they weren't literally brothers, but older brother Jesus and younger uh, disciple John. We get that picture throughout the Gospels, but we get a picture, that picture uh, of, of, of that relationship between Jesus and John again, because if you remember, if you've read the book of Revelation lately, uh, you know, Jesus went away, he, he, he went to... He, he, he's, he's in heaven on high, the right hand of the Father. Uh, John is on the island of Patmos. Uh, Jesus comes to him, at least in spirit, to give him the book of Revelation. And it, he's got fire in his eyes, Jesus does. And he's got like tattoos or something on his legs. And, and, he, and he carries swords and he rides on, on, a, white, on a white horse. And he, he's just all that, like super intimidating. But do you remember what he says to, to, to John early on in the book? He comes to him and John is frightened uh, beyond belief. And he drops to his knees and Jesus touches him and Jesus says, Don't be afraid. I mean, I know there's a lot to be afraid of here, he says, you know, Jesus. But, but he touches him and he says, don't be afraid. Because that, that was the kind of loving relationship that Jesus and John nicknamed the one whom Jesus loved. That was the kind of relationship they have. So when we study John the Apostle's first epistle, which we are, the summer of love, and we read and learn about love, we, we, we get it straight from the horse's mouth because he hung out with Jesus, and Jesus loved him dearly. And so Jesus, I'm mean John, he's an expert when it comes to love. So again, last week, the story of Jesus binds us together as, as friends. This week, how? How does that happen? I want to invite a friend up.
Michael Gonzalez, come on up. I want to, I want you to hear a little bit of his story. Welcome, Michael. Most of you have not yet, yet, (laughs) sorry, most of you have not yet met, wow, that's, that's quite a creative, most of you have not yet met uh, Michael, this is Michael Gonzalez. Michael, I have a few questions for you, you and I, you and I uh, talked about this. Now, I want you to know, like, he's going to say some really cool stuff, but I didn't set him up, I just asked him, and he gave these answers, they're going to, his answers, they're going to, unless he changes them, which I don't think he will, they're going to make you feel really good about yourself, and that's the point, that's the point. So the first question, how, how long have you been here at River Church? So I've been coming to River for three months. I'm on my third month coming here. So you came like late April? Something Mid-April. Like? Just Mid-April. About. Okay. Why did you decide to give River Church a try? So I have many friends that come here to River, uh, people that I've known before even coming to River. And each one of them had somehow casually floated the idea like, hey, come to church with us, uh, come to our gospel community. And I'd never take them up on the offer, but I just felt something in me in April, and I decided, like, you know what, I want to go. I told a friend of mine, I said, hey, I want to go to church. I will see you there Sunday. So ever since then, I've been coming. Okay. Question number three. What has kept you coming back? Because you, you came in April, but then you came again, and you came again. I think you've been here more in the last three months than I have, actually. So what, what, is, what has kept you coming back? Well, I greatly enjoy your sermons. I greatly enjoy everybody that I've gotten to meet here. I've just felt very welcomed here. And I truly do feel the Holy Spirit moving through this room when we get to meet here, when we get to listen to your sermons and just enjoy one another and praise God. Last question is this, what was your, um, and you've kind of already answered this, but answer it again. What was your first impression of River Church? Um, in, in a, what, was, what was different maybe about this place than other experiences that you, you've had? What, what was your first impression? Well, one, I felt welcome, but then two, I didn't feel like I was being singled out for being new or for being somebody that you all never seen before. So I really felt like I fit in. And it took me, I think, two or three sermons or two or three Sundays before I finally met you. And it's like you were just running away from me every time. I was like, after the service, I'm like, I'm going to go see Randy. And then Randy just, he went I, I, I was actually, yeah. That's I think so. <laughs> good. Well, that's, that's good because usually when, uh, when uh, people are new, they, they, they feel like I, like I smother them, like I... I, like I like, it's weird how I attack them, and so it's good to hear that maybe you, you felt like I, I wasn't, wasn't at least attacking. Thank you, brother. I'm glad you're here, and I hope you're here for a long, long time. Give, give Michael a hand. <laughs> it's a simple message uh, that Michael brings, and it's really a simple message that we're looking at over the course of this summer as we talk about kononia. Uh, community. Let's jump right in. Let's read um, the second, second installment of First John today. And last week was the first installment. We were studying verse by verse, so we're going fairly slowly. Uh, this week, verses 5 through 10. If you would join me, I'll read out loud and you follow along silently. Verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, with God, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light... As he is in the light, we have, and here's that word, fellowship with one another. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then one more time, in case you didn't get the, get the, get the, the message, he says it one more time. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. All right, so the major heresy, we talked about this last week, the major heresy going on in, in the church that it, that, it, that, it, that it caused a, a fragment, a part of the church to just leave, to, to like, we're just leaving church, like we're going to go hit the bar, we're, we're done with church. The, the, main, the main heresy of the, fa- of the fragment group uh, was the denial of Jesus' humanity. That, that he wasn't really a dude, a man, a human being with flesh and bones, And it's interesting to note that as John writes this this, this rebuttal or this response to this heretical teaching, the people left the church because they said Jesus wasn't really flesh and blood. When when John writes what we're reading, the, the, uh, the response to that, it's interesting to note that the result, the the symptom this fragment group, the symptom of not believing in the humanity of Jesus, the symptom was a disregard for others, a a not caring for others. And it's actually quite practical if you think about it because John, he's he's writing this letter to, 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 to fight against this false teaching and he's saying, look, remember from last week, we, we touched Jesus. I, you know, the, the, Da Vinci's painting, like, I, I laid my head on his shoulder. You know, and we, we, we saw him. We saw him heal. I heard his voice. I knew his, I knew, I, I knew his, his Galilean Aramaic uh, dialogue. Like, he was a real person. And, and the reason that, that this is so important to John is because Jesus really loved me. Like a human being can love a human being. Jesus came down here to fellowship with us and to love us and to communicate with us and to touch us and to to have this real human-to-human love. And and so you can't tell me, John, you can't tell me that he wasn't a real man. I know he was. And he writes this whole epistle in response. Okay, if if we can just unpack this kind of verse by verse now. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at what he's saying um, verse by verse. So, so verse 5, first of all, message, prayer from him, proclaim to you. And then what is the message? The message is this, God is light, and in him there is no darkness. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. We're going to throw some big words up on the, up on the screen today. First of all, truth. This is the truth that, that, that he is, that, that John is, is is, is, is pr- uh, providing here in verse 5. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. So, so what does this mean? We have another word for, that we use for God is light. We might say God is, is holy. The, the holiness of God. Sometimes we think of it, and rightfully so, we think of it as like the otherness of God. Why? Because left to ourselves, we're not very holy. Uh, left to ourselves, uh, we're not righteous. But, but, but God, he is the essence of holiness, of otherness, of, of righteousness. And this is where John begins in today's passage. He begins by saying, God is light. There's, there isn't even, he says, a, a measure, an ounce of darkness there, there's, no, there's no sin, there's no error in God, there is, no, there is not one blemish. John is saying God is the essence of holiness. 
It's said in many and various ways in, in, in Scripture. In James 1, it goes like this. James re refers to God as the Father of lights with whom there is no variation, with whom there is no shadow due to change. So, so what, is, what is John saying? Well, first of all, he's saying God is, he is dependably, reliably righteous, holy, pure, faithful, true. John would, would say, when we're talk, if, we, if we're talking about darkness now, darkness would be, would be sin and, and ungodliness and, and unrighteousness. And he might say it this way, darkness represents all that is not God. Because God is light. In Him, there is no darkness. So, so we, have, we have that truth, and, and this for us, now this is the bad news. We're going to get to the good news real quick, but, but this is the bad news. The, this for us is, the second big word, is a problem. The fact that God is light, and in Him there isn't even an ounce of darkness. For us as human beings, initially, that is a problem. And, and, and why? Why is this a problem? Well, we see it in verses 6 and verse 8. If we could go forward in, in verse 6. In verse 6, uh, John says, if, if we say we have fellowship with God, like, yeah, you know, me and God, like, like me and Jesus are tight. Like we, 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 we hang, we, 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 if we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And then verse 8, more, more of the problem, uh, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So the big words we've seen so far, the truth and the problem and the indictment be the next word. Well, John, I, 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 I may have said Paul actually a minute ago. John. John, in writing this letter, John is, is saying, number one, problem number one, I am living, and you are too, I am living a chronic lie if I say I have fellowship with God and I still walk in darkness. Paul says, I'm sorry, but, but you're lying. And, and, then, and then over there, we're not going to look at it again, but over there in verse 8, he says, and by the way, if I claim to be sin-free, I'm fooling myself. I'm not fooling anyone else. I'm not fooling my wife. I'm not fooling my children. You're not fooling your, your buddies at work. But if I say I am sin-free, I claim to be sin-free, I am fooling myself, it's utter nonsense. So see, this is all, this is all a problem. This is all like an, in, an indictment. How many times do we fall prey to, to this, this sort of... of of, of way of misrepresenting ourselves, you know. I'm a believer. I, 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 I follow Christ. I'm a, I'm a child of God. When in fact I continue to walk in darkness. It, it dropping names, you know, like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian. When maybe I have no business dropping names. It reminds me, I have this friend. And he, uh, he claims to, and in fact, he really does. It's really actually a true statement. I know this. I have evidence of this. But he claims to, to uh, actually know George Strait. Like he and George Strait are buddies, right? And, and, and so like sometimes he'll be like, yeah, I know, I know George Strait. He'll be like, I can call him right now. Well, like he's got him on speed dial, you know? And, and he probably does. Like, like he really knows George Strait. But when he, when he says that, it, it creates this sense of like, ah, come on, like, like, you don't really seem like a guy that rolled roll with George Strait, right? And, and I, like I said, he really does. 
but, but there's that sense of like, really? And, and John is really saying the same thing here. He said when we, when we say, yeah, Jesus and I, we spend time together. And I go out in the world and I say, you know, Jesus and I, we have a shared life together. But when in, in, in reality, I'm just stumbling in darkness, th- then John says that I'm, I'm lying to myself, I'm, I'm trying to lie to others, there, maybe there's secret sin, maybe there's secret shame. And I would ask you, don't, don't answer for anybody else and don't nudge anybody and don't even make a move, but just in your own heart of hearts, is, is that you this morning? Maybe living a secret life. No one knows about it. Listen, where we're going today is this. It is no wonder. It is no wonder that you feel distant and disconnected from any meaningful fellowship with other believers. I mean, you're spending all your, all your energy guarding your lie. It's It's taxing. To, to cover sin, isn't it? it? You grow weary. Where we're going today is that that is not Jesus' intention for your life. We'll get to that. Okay, so, so we've got the truth, we've got the problem, we've got, we got the indictment, and then, um, and then we've got the goal. And we see that in, in verse 7. You look at verse 7, and then you can go back to that screen. But verse 7 says this, but, you know, yeah, like we're, we're liars if we, if we walk in darkness and say we have fellowship with the Lord. And, and yeah, we're liars if we say that we are you know, like sinless, you know, that we, but, 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 verse 7, but, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have, we have what? We have we have fellowship with one another. Isn't that an odd turn in, in what he's saying? It actually matches up with what we looked at last week. But, but wouldn't you expect him to say, John, wouldn't you expect him to say, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we will have fellowship with the Lord, which of course is true. But that's not the point that John is trying to make here. The point that he's trying to make is if we walk in the light, what is it going to do? It's going to draw us together as, as, as brothers and sisters under the Lordship of Christ. If I walk in the light, and God is light, if I, if I walk in light, and by, by the way, I realize this isn't initially such great news because, dang it, how do I walk in the light? We're going to get there. We're going to get there. But but, but at least this is the goal. If this isn't necessarily the good news, at least it's the goal, and that is if I walk in the light, God is light. If I walk in the light, then I will have fellowship with others. If I could just figure out how to do that. I mean, like, if I could just figure out how to walk in the light, like, I've been, I've been trying to walk in the light. You have too, you know? It's like holding your breath, right? Every once in a while, you just can't hold your breath anymore. So then you stumble and you fall and you get up and I'm going to hold my breath one more time. If I, if I could just really figure out how to walk in the light. You ready for this? You, you, you can't. You can't. But, but praise be to our Lord and Savior. In Christ, the Lordship of Christ in your life, given what He's done on the cross, the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. How do we access that? We're going to talk about that. How do, we, how, do we, how do we make that effective in our lives? 
That's the goal. We will have friendship. We will have fellowship with one another once we are walking in the light. You see, nothing wrecks friendship. Nothing tears a church apart like unchecked, secret sin. Nothing rips a church apart like secret sin. So we have the truth that God is light. We have the problem. I walk in darkness. We have the indictment. I'm living a chronic lie when I say I have fellowship with God and still walk in the darkness. And then we have the goal. The goal is when the blood of Jesus washes me clean, I am now able to walk in light. I am now able to have fellowship with one another, with believers, a shared life with one another. And then John revisits the problem, the indictment, one more time in, in, in verse 8. If we claim that we are sin-free, we're, we're fooling ourselves. But now, now, on the other hand, on the other hand, and here's, here's where we start landing this plane today. Like, because, yeah, I want to walk in the light. I want to have fellowship with the Father. I want to be able to, I want to, be able to drop his name in public and it'd be, and it'd be authentic. And I want to have fellowship with, with, I want to have some real friends at church. I don't want it to be shallow, I want it to be deep. All that. Okay, so now let's start again trying to land this plane. And here's, here's the truth. It's, it's the solution. If I come clean, if, if you come clean, if, if I come clean, if I, if I stop fooling myself and pretending as though, you know, I'm better than you because I'm a pastor and I don't sin. If I started admitting my sin, start admitting my need, the point of this passage is that God is faithful. That Jesus, He went to the cross precisely because He knows we're jacked up. Like, like this idea that we're going to pretend, I'm going to pretend as though I, I don't sin, and like I'm not going to tell you my sin. You might find it out later, you know. Hopefully it's after I'm dead or after I move away, but until then you're not going to know my sin. We pretend as though like that's, what, that's what's expected of us. When, meanwhile, Jesus knows the whole reason he went to the cross. Again, he knows we're messed up. He knows we need a Savior. Here's the point. There is no need to hide your brokenness. There is no need to, to fake righteousness in your own life. There is no need to be embarrassed. I've, I've, come, to really, I've come to realize, Lydia and I were just talking about this the other day. I was, I've come to realize, because I've just seen it too many times, I've come to realize that, that when, and, and this often happens, when the pastor like, finds you out, and I don't, like, I don't, like, you know, do covert, like, work trying to figure out your sins, but, but when, ultimately, maybe there's just a breakdown, or there's just a crash and burn sort of experience, or whatever, and, and then, and then, like, I start walking you through stuff. You know what? I've seen it happen too many times. You know what ultimately happens? You leave the church. You know why? Because we are so ashamed of our sin that we decide once people know too much, I got to go start again. Isn't that a sad, isn't that a sad sort of state of um, the local church in many ways? That once my sin is found out, there's such shame, <clears throat> there's such like it's ir irreparable. I, I got to go, I got to go start faking it somewhere else. Meanwhile, if we go to God and we admit our need, Guess what? He will be true to himself. <clears throat> he always is. Who is he? He's light. He's, he's holiness. He's righteousness. He's making you an offer today. Do you see the offer that he is making you? He is making you an offer, and you can take him at his word, because John already told us, if you believe, if you believe his writings, and you, he already told us, look, <clears throat> there is there's not an ounce of darkness. He doesn't shift. He doesn't change. He's dependable. God is light in him. There is no darkness. That's the God who makes you an offer today.
In other words, given his character, he will do what he says he will do. Verse 10. I feel like I'm beating a dead horse now, but verse 10, like, it, um, it's in there somewhere. Um, it's so interesting that, that after all of the good news, that John has to one more time come back and tell us, hey, don't forget this. If we say we have not sinned, we make him, God, a liar, and his word is not in us. What, why does he come back to that? I mean, he's already made that point. Was he, was he just trying to make us feel bad? If we say we have not sinned, we make Jesus a liar. You know what I believe John is really saying here? I believe what John is really saying here is this. Your greatest problem isn't the fact that, that you need a Savior. We all need a Savior. Your greatest problem is that you won't admit that you need a Savior. That you're ducking and covering and pretending and posturing. You're haughty and you're proud and, and, and you, want, you want to be righteous on your... What do we call it? We call that self-righteousness. I, I want to be righteous on my own merit. And see, that, my friends, that is religion. That, my friends, that is the opposite of the gospel. That's John's whole point today. You can, you can be righteous on your own merit, which is a lie... And you make Jesus out to be a liar. In essence, what you say is, Jesus, you went to the cross. I didn't really need that. You could have skipped that part. Let's hang out. You can attempt to make yourself righteous. Again, your biggest problem, my biggest problem, it's not that that I need a Savior. There's nothing to be embarrassed. Like, we're all, isn't that freeing? Isn't that freeing? Like, we're all messed up. You know, like the island of misfit toys. That's every one of us, right? We all need a Savior. The, 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 the problem isn't that we need a Savior. The problem is we don't want to admit it. That's you today, maybe, sitting right where you are today. Maybe you'd be like, this is, this is bunk. This is junk. This is... Like just let's study the Proverbs. Like, give me some wisdom, right? Jesus went to the cross precisely because he knew we were sinners. There's nothing to be embarrassed or ashamed of. In our, in our, in our, in our hurt, in our brokenness, we, we go to God. And, and, and what, is, what does he do? He, he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And then we walk in the light. In review, in conclusion, if we look at all of those words, number one, truth. The truth is that, that God is light. And the problem is, <laughs> I'm not. I'm anything but light. Right? And the indictment is that I am living a chronic lie when I say, on the one hand, I, I, I have fellowship with God, but on the other hand, I continue to walk in the darkness. what is the goal? The goal is when the blood of Jesus washes me clean, not my own merit, not, not self-righteousness. It's rather, big theological word, imputed righteousness. In other words, God takes the righteousness of Christ and he places it on me and he now sees me uh, not just in a warm, fuzzy, you know, God is heavenly Father. No, he sees me actually as righteous. The righteousness of Christ, as I submit to his work on the cross, the righteousness of Christ now is placed on me. And, and, it's, and then what happens? I'm not on my own merit, not on my own strength, uh, but, but, but according to the, the strength, the, the power, and the presence of the Holy Spirit in me, according to the authority of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, now I am able to walk in the light myself, what I used to not be able to do. I'm able to walk. I don't have to hold my breath any longer. I can walk in the light. I can have fellowship with, again, interesting direction John takes. I can have fellowship with you. Yes, the Father, but you. A shared life with one another. So the solution, Jesus. And the result, friendship with God, friendship with others. Now, 
What am I inviting you to do? To, what am I inviting you to today? Like action point, right? Give me something I can do. And I think you would know that I would say, maybe you would know that I would say, well, Christ has already done it. Everything that we do now is just response. But, but how do we respond to such good news? That's why we call it the good news, the gospel. It's the story of Jesus. That's why we call it the good news. It's the story of Jesus. How, how do I respond? He did, he did the work. How do I respond? Well, three words, we're not even going to project them. You might memorize them or write them down. Number one, I invite you to authenticity. I invite you to authenticity. All of us, if we've, if, we've, if we've been in the church for any length of time, all of us have stories, don't we? Of how everybody else, uh, every, everyone else is, is, uh, is a hypocrite, right? We love to drop that word. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's you that's a hypocrite. Maybe it's not everybody else. So I invite you. Yeah, we've all seen that. We all, like... We hate to see it in others, but how about in me? I invite you to authenticity. Number, thing, number two, real, real, real similar. I invite you to, to simply admit, admit your need. Admit your need. Again, it doesn't surprise Jesus. He, he knows that you need him. It doesn't, it doesn't take God aback, like, what? You sin? I invite you to authenticity. I invite you to admit your need. And then the, the last word, um, I invite you to confession. That's what, if we can, you may have to scroll back, but if we can go back to verse 9 one more time. Or just go back or forward, I don't know. But I invite you to confession. Verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, and I would invite you to, don't, don't answer out loud, but to whom do we confess our sins? And, and yes, we confess our sins to Jesus. We absolutely do. But I want to submit to you today that in the context of this passage, John is quite probably, John is quite probably also encouraging us to confess our sins sins one to another. Now, I've been listening to uh, the Catholic radio station a lot lately. It has to do with the limitations of the radio that I have in my vehicle. But I've been listening to the Catholic radio, and I'm really fascinated by it. Uh, as a minister of the gospel, as a minister of the gospel, one of the things that I'm, I'm fascinated by and actually kind of a little freaked out by is, is the idea of uh, me being, I don't know, I don't mean to caricature anything or anybody, but me like being behind the wall with peoples and you coming and confessing your sins to me. Like, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't know that I would come back day two if I had to listen to your sins and not be able to really help you with them like for eight hours, you know. But, but the idea that we come together in the appropriateness of friendships within our gospel communities us as men studying the Bible on Wednesday mornings and the ladies studying the Bible Thursday nights and, and your prayer group or your, you know, Michael Gonzalez uh, gospel community. The idea that we come together and we actually say, listen, man, I, I've got a real need here. I, I, I'm, I'm really struggling here. I'm confessing this to the Lord, but I'm confessing this to you because I just need help. And, and, then, and then your brother, your sister says, like, I understand that. Not like, what? You do that? But like, I, I, like I've been there, man. Let's get through this together. I would dare say if you have a Christian friendship or several Christian friendships and you never confess sins and struggles to one another, it's probably a rather shallow friendship. It just probably is. If you're not regularly confessing, if, if you're hiding and, and covering, then fellowship in your life, it's probably really limited or 
It doesn't exist at all. I explained this last week. But I'm going to just go into it briefly. This, this fellowship, the root of that word, koine, yes, it means common, like common friendship, common fellowship, but it even means a bit, remember this from last week, a bit crude. Like koine Greek was like the common language, the trade language, the crude language. It wasn't what Jesus spoke at home. He spoke uh, a Galilean dialect of Aramaic. It, it wasn't what he spoke when he went to the temple. They spoke Hebrew, this high religious language. But when the masses would come together, or when, the, when there was trade to be done across borders, there was this crudeness, this like, we're just, you know, we have nothing in common here, but we need to get along, so we're going to speak this crude Koine Greek, and from that we have koinonia, this crude sort of friendship. In other words, if you're waiting to like, I'm waiting until a friend shows up who's like me, and then we'll be friends. That's not church. That's a club. There's, a, there's this crude commonality that draws us together that is only marked by the name and fame of Jesus Christ. That's what I call you to today, a deeper level of, a friendship. If you want that, we can help you with that. Bow with me and let's pray. God, we come to you today, uh, at least I, I have this sense of, wow, your, your words are really practical. It really, they really meet us where we're at. Every one of us, we have this deep sense, God, that we are, we are broken, we're fractured, we're a bit embarrassed by that. And in many cases, we are a bit lonely and isolated and friendless. And so... God, if this is true, what we've read today, if we have access to forgiveness and righteousness in Jesus Christ, and then if, if it's really true that that would draw us together more closely as, as friends, as, as a church, then may it be. May it be. I invite you where you're seated. I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to do anything that draws attention to you. But if, if you are if you are broken and humble to the point today that she would say, Jesus, I, I confess my sinfulness. Jesus, I need your forgiveness. Jesus, I need the righteousness that only you can bring that you bought for me on the cross. If that's you, then I'm not going to come to you, but you, you say that silently to Jesus. Just say, yes, Jesus. That's me, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. And we pray this in the strong and the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.